Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on addressing racial justice. Notre Dame students offer advice to the next president. I'm Laurie Nathan. I'm director of the mediation program at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, which forms part of the Kia School of Global Affairs at Notre Dame. I'm going to make some opening remarks and then introduce the panelists to you. The field of peace studies is concerned not only with peace, but also with justice. In 1969, Johann Galtung, a Norwegian scholar who was one of the pioneers of peace studies, published a famous article that framed the relationship between peace and justice in a radical way. Galtung's approach has had a profound influence on the thinking of successive generations of scholars, students, and activists. According to Galtung, Violence is not limited to hitting and shooting and stabbing, to physical acts. Rather, the violence is present whenever people are, are prevented from realizing their potential, and the difference between the actual and the potential is avoidable and preventable. Preventive. Galton argued that violence, so defined, does not only have physical forms. It also has symbolic, psychological, and structural forms. And he draws a vital distinction between personal violence, where violence is committed directly by some person or group of people, and structural violence, where violence is embedded in the structure of society. Structural violence manifests itself in unequal power relations in a society and consequently in unequal potential and unequal life chances. This distinction between personal violence and structural violence is vital because we tend to get agitated by personal violence, which is visible and dramatic, and we tend to be less agitated by structural violence, which is insidious and less noticeable. But structural violence can be every bit as dangerous and damaging as personal violence, and it therefore deserves as much of our attention. We see and hear the body swinging from the tree. We see and hear the jogger being chased down by armed men in a vehicle. We see and hear the knee on the neck of the man crying out for his mother. But many of us do not see and do not hear the decades long, years long, centuries long effects of racial discrimination and racial inequality in income, wealth, education, health, housing, policing, criminal justice, community safety, social services, and more. Collectively and incrementally, this discrimination and inequality suffocate the potential and often the lives of millions of African Americans and other people of color. In 1969, Johann Galtung in this famous article illustrated the idea of structural violence by highlighting the problem of systemic racism in the United States. He illustrated this problem of systemic racism with a statement made by Stokely Carmichael, then a leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Black Panther Party in the 1960s. Galtung quotes Carmichael, who later changed his name to Kwame Ture, is saying the following. It is important to this discussion of racism in the US to make a distinction between two types of racism, individual racism and institutional racism. The first type, said Carmichael, consists of overt acts by individuals with usually immediate results of the death of victims or the traumatic and violent destruction of property. This type can be recorded on TV cameras and can frequently be observed in the process of commission. The second type, institutional racism, is less overt, far more subtle, less identifiable in terms of specific individuals committing the acts, but it is no less destructive of human life. The second type, institutional racism, is more the overall operation of established and respected forces in society and thus does not receive the condemnation that the first type receives. Galton concluded that sustained political and social attention should be paid 
both to negative peace, meaning the absence of personal violence, and also to positive peace, meaning the absence of structural violence and the presence of social justice. At this moment of national reckoning and national outrage on racism, our panel discussion provides a platform for Notre Dame students to speak out on these issues and to offer their advice to the next US president on addressing racial justice. Our students at Notre Dame and elsewhere are among the new generation of voters, activists, and concerned citizens whose voices deserve to be heard. We have a wonderful lineup of students. In order of speaking, they are Maya Perry, representing Black Lives Matter, Michaela Murphy, representing the Native American Student Association at Notre Dame, Janila Moresby, representing the Graduate Student Union, Lala Petty, representing the Black Students Association, Naomi Price, representing the Black Law Students Association, Kaya Lawrence, representing student government, and Fiona Arbab, who is a student associate of the mediation program. The students have been asked to speak for five minutes each and Fiona will make closing remarks. I should add that we've attracted numerous Notre Dame co-sponsors for this event, including the provost's office. And you can see the names of the co-sponsors and their statements on racial justice on the website of the mediation program. We invited both presidential campaigns to participate in our discussion, but regrettably, neither of them has sent a representative. And since this event is being recorded, we plan to send the two presidential campaigns copies of the recordings and invite them to respond. And if they do respond, we will put their responses on the website. The absence of the presidential campaigns does mean positively that we have more time for Q&A. And members of the audience are welcome to use the Q&A function in Zoom if they wish to raise questions. So let me invite Maya Perry to open our discussion. I should say that she is the only one of our students who is not at Notre Dame. Maya is studying at IUSB, and therefore we are very ha happy to welcome her as a special guest. So with that, um, I hand over to you, Maya. Thank you. Um, hello, and thank you to Notre Dame and the Kroc Institute for having me. Um, as he said, I am an Indiana University South Bend student. I'm a senior, and I'm here representing Black Lives Matter South Bend. Um, the, the past four years, um, the cracks in our country have become even more pronounced. Every news cycle and announcement seem to further divide communities, and each day, COVID wreaks havoc throughout. Our next president will have to be intentional in their efforts to heal our fractured nation and ensure that all people, regardless of group identity, are united for the common good of all. This arduous task will require patience, perseverance, and compromise. But that compromise should not endanger the health and well being of people of color. We need legislation that specifically and concretely addresses the racial disparities in wealth, education, law, medicine, and housing. We cannot fall into traps of colorblindness that erase the centuries long history of racial and economic disparities that have culminated in this moment. The protection of those who are most deeply affected must be centered in order to create equity. Racial equity is a bipartisan issue. Our next president must not only address racial justice, but address it in such a way that all people understand its value. That's, that is the only way to make it a reality which is why I suggest that our next president work with Congress to pass the BREATHE Act. The BREATHE Act is the result of a nationwide outpouring of pain, righteous anger, and unbridled hope. In the wake of the largest social justice movement in global history, the president has a responsibility to seriously engage this legislation. The BREATHE Act is broken down into four separate parts. It aims to divest federal resources from incarceration and policing, which includes closing the federally funded concentration camps um, or immigration detention facilities that we have at our borders, to invest in new non-punitive, non-carceral approaches to community safety 
that lead states to shrink their criminal legal systems and center the protection of Black lives, all Black lives, to, alloc to allocate new money to build healthy, sustainable, and equitable communities, and to hold political leaders to their promises and enhance the self-determination of all Black communities. These ambitious goals can seem overwhelming, heavy-handed, or even utopian by some standards, but these same objections were raised in response to the Civil Rights Act. Change is necessary, and right now change is possible. The United States incarcerates more of its people than any other country in the world. And our punitive approach with mass incarceration has been detrimental to Black and Latinx communities while doing nothing to, cur to curtail violence. People should not fear their protectors, and people should not fear their government. By divesting from police departments, we will be able to fund new community initiatives that address the issues officers are not trained to respond to. It will also enable us to create community programming that addresses the underlying causes of crime in communities of concentrated disadvantage. In the words of Zora Neale Hurston, there are years that question in years that answer. 2020 is the year for answers. We cannot afford to waste time on reform efforts that have been proven ineffective time and time again. As of August 30th of this year, 661 civilians have been fatally shot by police, 123 of whom were Black. And it may seem uneasy to envision a world without policing, Many worry that it will make them less safe, but many of us are unsafe now under the system as it currently stands. Our next president must take the leap from symbolic support and gestures to create new systems that protect and affirm Black lives. And this comprehensive piece of legislation is just one step along the way to creating a nation that finally lives up to its principle of liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Great, Maya, thank you. I hand over now to Michaela Murphy. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the land I am currently using to speak to you today is on the traditional homelands of several tribes, including the Miami, Peoria, and most recently, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. I start with this because I believe that every event in America should begin with acknowledging the tribes who called this land their home for thousands of years before colonialism especially if the event includes the President of the United States. Since the founding of the United States, no US president has held the best interests for indigenous people in mind. We continue to be left out of important conversations and decisions regarding race and racial issues. Start by acknowledging us, acknowledging our existence, acknowledging our needs. Address the issues of missing and murdered indigenous women, Currently, Native American women are murdered at a rate that is 10 times higher than any other demographic in the United States. According to the CDC, murder is the third highest cause of death in Native American women. Stop turning a blind eye to this. Start acknowledging it. Begin with the US government starting to work with tribal nations to see how they can help in addressing this growing issue. Fix systematic issues that prevent these cases of missing and murdered indigenous women going unsolved. Create laws that protect Native women on tribal land. Native women deserve to feel safe in this country, in their country. Start acknowledging the trauma that was inflicted on children in Native American boarding schools. Acknowledge the pain and suffering that the, that the boarding school system caused in Native communities for generations. Acknowledge that these schools were supported by the US government. That the US government supporting, supported putting children in handcuffs and taking them from their families that they supported decades of physical, mental, and sexual abuse. The damage that these schools caused is irrevocable. And after you acknowledge that, begin reparations for those survivors and their descendants. Restitution is not the cure to this trauma, but it is a way of seeking forgiveness for a crime that should have never happened. The list of things that the United States could do better for Native Americans is endless. We need better access to clean drinking water. We need a better healthcare system. We need to make ra racist native mascots illegal. We need to be promised the right to vote. 
We need to acknowledge that Mexican people are indigenous to this land and they deserve the right to use it. We need better education systems on reservations. We need better education on Native Americans throughout the country. We need to address police brutality against Native people. We need to stop being forgotten about. Indigenous people are a constant in American history. At every turn, we are fighting for our rights and our presence in the country that we called home for thousands of years. And at every turn, we are forgotten. Native Americans were one of the last to be given US citizenship. Native women were one of the last groups to be given the right to vote. It wasn't until 1978 that Native Americans were given religious freedom, which should be acknowledged here at Notre Dame, a religious institution. Never forget about the Native American removals when Native people were forcibly removed from their homes for stolen land, where they walked for miles and miles and many people died. Don't forget the massacres inflicted upon Native people in the pursuit of land. Don't forget what we have suffered and what we continue to suffer. Finally, think about the outcomes of the decisions you make as president. They directly impact all of us, indigenous, indigenous or not, a person of color or not, and we all deserve so much better than what we have been given. Thank you. Okay, Le, thank you for that. Um, I hand over to Janila. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Nathan. Um, so uh, my name is Janelia and I'm representing the Graduate Student Union as Dr. Nathan said earlier. So uh, in 2014, Eric Garner was murdered by the police officers um, in a choke old position while repeating the words, I can't breathe. Over the past few years, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and several other black men and women were murdered for simply working, driving a car, or jogging on the street. In other words, these individuals were murdered for being black. It is clear now, just as it was before, that there is a serious issue of racial injustice in the United States of America. We live in a time when black girls, boys, men, and women are seen as threats to those around them for simply wearing a hoodie or reaching for their driver's license on a regular police stop. This all needs to be changed. My suggestions to the next president of the US are as follows. One, Please change the current policies that exist. Implement strict policies which will allow black men and women to be treated equally as your white counterparts when they face injustice. Put laws in place which will ensure that black people who are stopped by the police are not killed for their skin color. Secondly, implement laws which will mandate training for officers which will teach them how to arrest someone without harming them or taking their lives. Instead of shooting first and asking later what happened, officers need to assess situations more properly and handle every citizen irrespective of color or race with respect. Thirdly, pass laws which will allow black pregnant women to be seen as a priority in the hospital when giving birth. In turn, implement policies that will prosecute health um, professionals who do not take the necessary actions to take care of black patients as equally as they do for their white patients. Finally, provide secured funding for schools located in underprivileged communities. This will allow every Black child to have an equal opportunity to be successful in their studies. As an ex-president of the US, you have the ability to help implement changes which will allow Black men and women to be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. Please make the necessary changes. Thank you. Great, thank you, Janelia. Um, I wish the presidential campaigns were here to uh, present to hear you all. I hand over to Lala Petty. I am here today, vulnerable, petrified, overwhelmed, but most importantly, determined to use my voice as a representation for all students, especially those who are labeled under the category lower socioeconomic minorities. I want to mention that all of our ancestors knew how far the daily reality of America strayed from the myth, and yet they never folded. They never gave in. Somehow, someway, they came together and said, okay, we're gonna make this work. And I know this because we are all here today. We need those words to come to life. 
The spirit of this country is rising up to change things we should have changed a long time ago. Therefore, with these next four years, we need a leader who can compound. Of course, there are only four years in a term, so I understand that we may not be able to climb mountains, but we can start by walking up a hill. I do believe the idea of compounding can help make improvements towards racial justice. Turning minor adjustments into significant political, economic, social, educational, structural, and environmental improvements. We have to make adjustments to those six aspects to combat systemic racism and create a space for racial justice. For example, there is no secret that many major corporations in America, like companies and schools and their shareholders have benefited from the structural racism, intentional inequality, and indifference to suffering. To begin making small adjustments, we can start with a couple of commitments. Number one, commit to anti-racism personnel policies and racial equity training. Two, commit to pay equity. There's no excuse for the disparity in wages paid to people of color. Within that conduct, a wage equity inspect and make the adjustments needed. Three, commit to fair employment applications like eliminating the required box for a college degree for jobs that don't need one. Four, commit to giving employees a voice. Ensure representation of women, people of color, hourly employees, and all employment policies. Five, commit to funding schools in poor communities. These are just a few minor adjustments you can make to help close the gap that minorities, especially Black people, consistently have to diligently work so hard for just to still not be on the same level. What you do, the decisions you make, the policies you sign will echo through generations. Moreover, through your term, you can make adjustments that will help elevate this country. It feels like our country is at level one, a starting point. This time I advise you to try to listen to future leaders and those who have had traumatic experiences in this country. Listen to those in failing communities. Listen to those who were in prison. Listen to those who lost their jobs. Listen to the grocery store workers, the bus drivers. Listen to those who wake up every day in this country and feel like they don't belong due to racial injustice because we are too a part of this country. To the next president, thank you for having the grit and diligence to be our leader, the head of our country, one of the most important jobs in this world. With this extensive responsibility, I need you to act as such. Moreover, I believe there is power in numbers. And to gauge more insight, I asked my, co my cohort of the Ambrose Scholars Initiative Program on what advice they'd give to the next president on addressing systemic racism. Here are a few things they said. Number one, you will never make everyone happy, but your job is to keep people in this country safe and comfortable. Two, this position is a position of humility and service. Incorporate those aspects into your thoughts and decisions. Three, as a president, you are a leader, and a great leader knows when to listen to others, like professionals, or like those who work and struggle in this country. Four, please take action, and if there is no reliable solution at that moment, voice that, and if you make a mistake, be honest and take accountability. Five, personally, as a woman, a young woman who was raised on integrity, honesty, accountability, and humility, I strongly believe you should never let your position compromise your morals. When you address crucial issues of this country like systemic racism and racial injustice, think of the people to whom it affects, their pain, their sacrifices, their eternal worry because they are a major part of this country. And as president, you need to take care. You need to care for the political, economic, social, educational, structure, structural, and environmental realms of all people. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Lale, thank you very much. Um, I hand over to Naomi. Hello, everyone. My name is Naomi Price, and I am a second year law student at the Notre Dame Law School. It is my privilege to speak to you today on behalf of the Black Law Students Association at Notre Dame. So thank you to the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies for inviting us. At this point, I hope you can see the common thread transpiring through this panel. 
For hundreds of years, Black people have been uniquely subjugated and forced to endure racial injustices every day in our society. And over the past several months, we've seen these injustices reach new heights. The racial disparities inherent in our system have been emphatically visible as we've battled with disproportionate effects of a global pandemic, we have borne witness to the callous killings of too many Black lives in a matter of weeks. The call to action across the world and in our country in response to this violence against the Black community has in many ways been unprecedented. And that calls for unprecedented leadership. We, the members of the Notre Dame Black Law Students Association, are hurting, but we refuse to stop fighting for change. We are channeling our feelings and fatigue into something beautiful, a more just world. But we are the 5% attending the Notre Dame Law School. We are the 5% who will be becoming judges, senators, public servants. And we are the 5% carrying the weight of our communities on our shoulders when we walk into the legal world against the 95% responsible for the treatment of our black brothers and sisters. To be clear, we on this panel are not merely given advice on racial justice. We are calling you to action to fight racial injustice by focusing on three things you can do to make America a better place. So first, we ask you to listen, support, and promote Black forms of Black voices. We need Black voices at the table. It is not enough to make paternalistic policies. Black people need to be invited and welcomed into conversations about how to address systemic racism and inequalities in our societies. They need to be welcome as more than mere tokens of diversity. This means hiring and promoting Black people and people of color in your cabinets in positions of leadership. This means nominating Black judges, supporting Black legislators. Second, to fight racial injustice, you as leaders must recognize that our country will start to heal when we reckon with the legacy of our history. History is replete with systemic disenfranchisement of Black communities, yet many times it is not acknowledged in our textbooks. And as I sit here in law school, in our casebooks, if it wasn't for me attending an HBCU, I would have never known about a lot of the contributions of the Black community in America. Therefore, promoting Black voices starts with reckoning with America's past and persistent treatment of Black individuals throughout concerted efforts to teach history in the education system and in parallel investing in our schools to raise the 5%. But you must go beyond that. Race neutral policies will not resolve structural racism, but race forward policies will. This means supporting legislation such as the Crown Act and other bills and international treaties promoting environmental, health, fighting voter suppression, decriminalizing black skin. Considering to reconcile with America's truth will help to build a more equitable future. Finally, and most importantly, we ask that you do not politicize black lives. That means that as an, as an American people, we cannot be further divided by racial lines. Acknowledging our humanity should not be a political fight. The fight for Black lives as a movement is about respect and recognition of the unique struggles and pain that has endured for generations within the Black community. It is us holding accountable those who claim the Constitution is about equality and opportunity for all. It is not about making promises to garner votes. It is not about using devising narratives. And it is not about using race as a political token. So those three advisors are a call to action. As Alicia Garza, co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement said, Black people have always played a role in unlocking the promise of an America that has not yet been realized. And if there was ever a time to tap into that power, it's now. And that is why this is a call to action you cannot ignore. So I was given five minutes to speak and my first thought was that 
there would be no way for me to do justice to the stakes of the next presidential term in this short amount of time. Um, but my second thought was that it only takes two words. Brianna Taylor. I want to end this message by holding a moment of reflection in reverence to the life of Brianna Taylor. Our ultimate ask today is that you help build an America where our institutions will no longer promote and facilitate a system where the killing of an American hero will be left unanswered. So at the Notre Dame Law School, we pride ourselves for being different kind of lawyers. So we ask you to be a different kind of leader, one who will build a future where our blackness will no longer be the weapon of anyone's fears. One where the issues raised by this panel will be important enough to garner your interest. Thank you. Naomi, thank you. I'm gonna to turn to Kaya Lawrence. Um, and then we're going to open up for some questions that I'll put to you all. So Kaya, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. My name is Kaya. Um, I'm a senior and I'm here on behalf of student government. For centuries, our country's history has been tainted by what is referred to as the original sin of slavery. Even after the formal institution of slavery ended, its legacy has remained. For Black Americans, the end of slavery only constituted the beginning of a quest for democratic equality. Racial injustices have persisted in our society, resulted, resulting in a very specific form of Black oppression. 2020 has been a difficult and trying year at its best. Over the past several months, we have witnessed a blatant disregard for Black lives as we've seen multiple senseless killings of Black individuals. The COVID-19 pandemic has also shed light on the racial disparities and who is most vulnerable and marginalized in our society. The disproportionate harm suffered by people of color and specifically Black Americans in times of crisis make visible the pressing issue of sy systemic racism that persists in our country. Black people cannot leave their homes without risking their lives. And this constitutes one of, if not the most pressing issue in our society. Racism is a chronic disease in America and a deadly one. Its effects are felt throughout the entire African-American community and are not only physical, but also emotional and social. There is not an easy way to put it. Racism is destroying this country. Recent times have provided a painful reminder of the injustices that continue to plague our world. It is evident that there remains a fundamental racial injustice in our society and that the sin of racism pervades our country. It's important to remember that this is not a political issue. Racial justice cannot be cast as one amongst many other issues battled along partisan lines. This is an issue of human rights and one that involves every member in our society. Injustices in our culture, institutions, and structures of society divide us. This is not a new issue. It is only the latest battle in a war Black Americans have fought in for centuries. Racism is systematic and institutionalized, and it has persisted for centuries. This issue concerns us all. Others must join the fight for racial justice and demand that Black Americans be provided with the right to live in safety and with dignity. The road to healing and instituting change after centuries of oppression will be long and hard, but we must persist. It is incumbent upon us all to take on this issue and fight to secure a society that is equal for all. Our country, and particularly the occupier of our nation's highest office, is tasked with rebuilding the bonds of trust that have been strained and broken and must engage in instituting changes that promote racial equality. If ever there were a single moment for the executive branch to commit to advancing racial justice, that moment is now. It is morally imperative for the future success of our country that whomever assumes the presidency in January have a well-defined strategy to answer the de deafening call for racial justice. It's tough political work to eradicate systemic racism, and it's not the sole responsib responsibility of the next president to do so. However, he will have the power to bring the national fight onto a platform with the power to initiate change. The current racial climate in this country reflects the bitter truth that there are two Americas, 
one where the American dream is a reality and the other where Black Americans are confronted daily with the very real possibility of being targeted and possibly killed as a result of the color of their skin. We need a president that will make it a priority to take steps to creating one America in which the inherent dignity of each individual is recognized and protected. The need and demand for racial justice is deafening and it is well within the power of the White House to answer a call like this. Our next president must objectively oppose the violations of dignity faced by people of color in this country. Empty performative allyship will not be allowed. Statements of racial justice must be accompanied by meaningful action. To stand in solidarity means nothing if one is not actively engaged in implementing tangible change. It is the responsibility of our nation's most prominent leaders to condemn the systemic racism that persists in our country. It is necessary to acknowledge the legitimacy of the Black community's fight against racial injustice and white supremacy, and to pursue a state of social affairs in which all can share in the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. In the words of the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. As the leader of the free world and the occupier of our nation's highest office, it is the duty of the next president to take a stand and encourage others to join together to help combat systems of oppression in this country. If the next president chooses to remain silent and complicit in the ongoing battle against racism, he chooses to side with the oppressive forces and sets an intolerable example for others in this country and the world at large. It will be his duty to advocate for Black Americans and combat the systems that have continuously failed them. And it is my hope that this goal will be recognized and achieved. Thank you. Great, Kaya, thank you. So thank you to all our panelists. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, Fiana will make some closing remarks, but she's welcome to join the conversation. I'm gonna put some questions to you. And since this is a university event, the questions are meant to be a little tough. Um, we wouldn't wanna throw simple and easy questions at you, would we? So let me start with a question about addressing in a robust and rigorous way the many manifestations of racial inequity and injustice in the US, which all of you are saying is a duty and obligation of the next president. On the other hand, there are also calls for the next president to be more of a unifying force, to make an effort to overcome the acute polarization that afflicts the country and which has manifested itself through physical violence. Is there a tension between advocating strongly for racial justice on the one hand and promoting unity and seeking to transcend polarization on the other? Is there a tension? And I invite any of you that, that wants to respond as you see fit to just indicate with your hand and I'll call on you to speak. Kaya. Yeah, um, I feel like the answer to, to this question should be fairly simple. Um, I think there does exist attention, but there shouldn't. I think um, the call for racial justice is not one that should be political. And um, I think that it should, the two parties should avoid making this issue one in which can be like taken advantage of to create tensions between the two parties. Um, racial justice is something that affects people's lives and their well-being in this country. And it's the job of the nation's leaders to protect and promote their well-being. So at the end of the day, I think racial justice and you know the fight to secure it um, is one that is the duty of the next president and one that shouldn't be um, weaponized in between the two parties. And politicize in the sense of, of boiling it down to partisan party politics. Um, Fiona? Yeah, I really agree with Kaya. I'm thinking about even the, like, the inherent process of racialization reflects this tendency we have as a nation to promote binary thinking. There's often in conversations perhaps the inherently political conversations as well where we assert right and wrong, black and white, um, positive, negative, um, when our reality is far more complex 
um, which is kind of the insidious nature of systemic violence, like you alluded to in your opening remarks. Systemic violence, um, you know, when mixed with our tendency to polarize and to think in binary terms, um, is quite detrimental to our humanity um, because instead of seeing systemic violence and issues where, so for example, I think some people may be fearful of not politicizing race because that means in this context that we should promote, you know, things like all lives matter, very neutral, um, you know, rhetoric, ignoring systemic discrepancies and, and power dynamics. But what if instead of using these power dynamics or discrepancies to other and racialize human beings, we could use these discrepancies and acknowledge power dynamics for, um, I don't know, it sounds very <laughs> ambiguous, but restorative, restorative frameworks of understanding the human experience. So rather than having rigid categorizations of human beings, you know, based on the way that um, peoples are treated. I mean, I'm not, tr I don't think, I don't think recognizing a common humanity should equal erasing historical and political realities. But recognizing a common humanity and recognizing the ways in which some human beings have been mistreated for very particular historical and political contexts should teach us a lesson about how, number one, to reconcile, to repair and restore those relationships with those human beings and uplift them back into this common humanity. So it shouldn't be yeah, for the sake of polarization, but rather to understand um, yeah, restorative practices of bringing us all back to being a common humanity. Okay, I want to follow that up with another question. Um, if we talk about the necessity for reconciliation and healing, and one often hears that in the immediate wake of yet another killing of a black person, that there you hear one or more public officials talk about the necessity for healing. Is healing and reconciliation, are healing and reconciliation possible in the absence of reparations? Meaning it's not sufficient to simply acknowledge harm done. One has to give effect to that in ways that may be symbolic, that may be financial that, and economic, that may be material in other ways. So the question is whether healing and reconciliation are possible in the absence of acknowledgement and reparations of some appropriate form. Lala, you're shaking your head. You want to? Um, I would say I don't think healing is possible in the absence of acknowledgement and like a call to action. I believe that's why we have call to actions now. Um, so I, I do believe for the first step is acknowledgement. And the follow-up after acknowledgement should be steps to making something happen. Just like, I mean, I mentioned in my um, speech, like minor adjustments. We can start with the acknowledgement and then we can start with minor adjustments and then we can compound those ideas to make something um, significant happen. So I don't, I don't believe that, um, I don't, at least, um, what's the word for it? I don't believe the um, world healing is possible without acknowledgement and um, and um, call to action, but maybe personally it may be because every person is different and they heal on their own terms, but I don't believe it's possible in terms of like looking at the world. Thank you. Um, Michaela, do you want to come in on this question? Yeah, sure. Um... I, I kind of disagree with Lala. Um, I think healing can happen in a community without reparations being made from the um, aggressor. Um, but for there to be reconciliation, I think that there has to be reparations beyond just acknowledging that something 
bad happened or that someone did something wrong. I think um, that there definitely has to be some sort of um, symbolic, at the very least, um, reparation being made. Um, that's kind of tied into what uh, Kaya said about how you can't just say things. You have to have like actual meaningful action. Otherwise, what what do your words mean? Um, especially when it's historic trauma. Um, anyone can say sorry for something that happened 100 years ago. How, what are you going to do to fix the way it's impacting us today? There's really no way for that to happen with just acknowledging. Um, Kaya. Yes, to go off of um, Michaela and Lala, I think that within a community themselves, who those who have been harmed, I think that there can be healing there. But I think if we're thinking of the bonds of trust between those communities and say the nation's leaders or the white majority, I don't think that there can be healing between those two groups without some kind of acknowledgement or action to address the harm. I immediately thought of an injury and I feel like trying to start a process of healing before there's been acknowledgement of the harm done is like trying to put a bandage on a gaping wound. Like there has to be some sort of part in the process where you give it stitches or something like that. Like there just has to, there from coming from say the aggressor, there needs to be a part in the process where they are addressing the harm done and making steps to fix that before you can work on repairing the bonds of trust and creating healing between those two communities. Good, thank you, Kai. So I, what, what we're hearing is a distinction in the responses between personal healing, intra-group healing, and intergroup healing, and the responses are, and strategies are different at these different levels. Naomi? Yes, I, I guess I'll just add a quick comment to that, but um, this question really highlights the fact that there is not one solution to the problem. Um, I think a lot of people are looking at it in a very binary way and it's just the wrong way to look at it. Um, it's a system. So it's at every layer of our society and we need to tackle it at different, you know, from different angles. And frankly, you know, different communities live it differently. Not, there's not one black experience. I always say that. So, and I'm sure that's the same for other racial groups that are suffering from racial injustice. So this really, I think we need to look at it differently. It's not a binary issue. Um, it's, it's, it must be a comprehensive solution um, what, that in which everyone takes a part of and participates in, so. I, yeah, that's very helpful. In January this year, during MLK Walk the Walk Week at Notre Dame, the mediation program organized a panel discussion on reparations. And the key position taken by the mediation program is that there needs to be a conversation about this issue. And we can't say in advance how the conversation will end, but it's a conversation that needs to happen. And if it's a constructive dialogue between targeted and victim communities on the one hand and perpetrators or beneficiaries of perpetrators. That dialogue, if it's done constructively, will yield healing results and concrete action. Let me turn the, the topic slightly to look at our campus because some of the questions that we received prior to the event, even though this uh, panel discussion is talking to the next president, some of the questions understandably, understandably related to racist incidents on campus. And the questions really revolved around, well, what should we do? What should we do about racism? If it's perceived racism from faculty or perceived racism from students or staff, what advice would you give, so this is giving advice to the university now, what advice would you give on how we can best manage the problem of racism when it does arise on our campuses. Janelia, would you want to kick off our okay, response? Yeah, sure. 
Um, so I, I, I want to take it from a different angle than I answer your question. I think one of the biggest issues that needs to be solved on campus is we need to have more black faculty. Um, right now, uh, when you look in the classrooms, um, starting from the lecturer down, uh, it's predominantly white. And so therefore, if a black student is in a classroom with um, 500 other students, who, which um, maybe 450 are white, the professor is white, you're already outnumbered. And so if you are racially profiled, who do you go to? There's nobody that looks like you in a leadership position that can help you. And so I think we need to start there. We need to correct that issue. We need to get more black people in leadership positions on campus so that black students feel safer in the classrooms initially. From there, I think we need to have, um, I know we should have a diversity and inclusion office here, but how safe do students feel going there to report, you know, how like things that happen to them. And then also if you're racially profiled on campus and you say something, how does your professor treat you afterwards after knowing that you, you know, experienced that incident. So we need to have some form of confidentiality um, process on campus, which um, protects black students and doesn't um, put them in a place of being targeted after being um, speaking up about a specific issue. Um, I also think another deem on the side of faculty needs to ensure that more black faculty are being tenured here, um, not just to get them in as associate professors, but keep them here so that they can continue to build and even help Notre Dame to figure out how can we fix this racial injustice across campus. From my, pers my, my perspective as a graduate student, I have never met a black professor, a black advisor, a black PI on campus. And in my building alone, there are only um, four black students in McCourtney Hall. And so that's just to show you um, the level of like, what would I say, like diversity that Notre Dame has here. And so I think also that they need to um, try to get more black students in um, Notre Dame. I'm not sure how the admissions process works, but um, we need to look at that to see is there discrimination um, against a student's color, for example, when they're applying um, to Notre Dame? Are we just looking at grades and stuff? But And then also, are we taking in black students just to say that we are a diverse school? Or are we really taking them in because we care about them? Because most people People, um, they'll tell you, oh, we have a black person on our team. That means we're diverse, but that doesn't really mean that you're diverse. It means that you're trying to represent diversity. So we need to be more meaningful with our actions and ensure that whenever we're um, bringing in black people in the conversation or we're bringing them to the table, that we see them as important and not just as um, a statistic, so to speak. So yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. That's a, a really comprehensive answer. Thank you. Um, Naomi, and then Maya, you're at a different university, but you're also welcome when Naomi's done to come in on the conversation. Um, Naomi. Yes, yeah, so once again, from a, a professional student perspective, um, I want to echo everything uh, Janela just said. Um, I mean, in the law school, it's only 30 black students out of 599, if you want the, the specific numbers, and we only have two black faculty. Um, so it, it's a huge problem and, and I think she's really talked about, you know, retention. We need to, you know, it's one thing to attract uh, black, black talent, black students, black, black professors, but um, you have to retain them. And that means that you have to value their opinions once they're here, you have to value their voices once they're here. And I think that that's one of the problems that we're having um, at the university. I would also say that there are a lot of opportunities for um, faculty, students, and staff to get involved and to get educated. Um, as far as the law school is concerned, we have programming against microaggressions that us students have put forth, and some professors have started to really get, got, get more interested in those. Um, but we need more. We need more interest. And so there's, if we're not recognizing that it's a problem, um, we're, we're not going to move forward. So, um, but, you know, what Janela said really hit, hit the nail in the head. So. Good. Uh, thank you, Naomi. And um, Maya? So, as you said, that answer was very comprehensive. Um, and so, yes, I agree with everything that you said. I've got a different perspective because I am not a Notre Dame student. Um, I'm an IU South Bend student. Um, 
and we have our own issues over there, of course, as every school does. Um, I am a secondary education major, and within my program, there are only three Black students, I think, in my year, which is unacceptable, um, especially when we're looking at the students that we're supposed to be serving. Um, so I think that universities need to really empower their Black students, Black and Brown students, all minority students need to be empowered. They need to feel that they belong so that when there are issues, they are able to advocate for themselves and know that there is someone who they can trust who will listen to them. And as you said, we need more Black faculty at all universities um, so that there is someone there that understands their experience and their point of view. Um, I also think that we need to funda fundamentally kind of change the way that the university is interacting with minority students. And instead of, you know, using that old analogy of like bringing people to the table, I hate it. Like, we, like I don't want to come to your table. We need to be creating a space that I don't feel that I need to be invited into. That I feel that I have a voice that will be heard and a say in how things are structured. So I think that, that that's a tangible way in which universities can support their black students. Uh, Maya, thank you. So I'm gonna hand over to Fiana and then Kaya and then Michaela. And then we'll start to draw the conversation to a close. Fiana. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. Um, Definitely uh, uplifting everything that's been said before me. Similarly, I study in the Masters of Global Affairs at the Keough School um, under, you know, where uh, Mediation Center is located. And we, as of this year, have three Black students. Um, the composition of our student population is slightly different. It is actually, I would say, probably the most diverse student population I've seen on campus. Um, particularly because we are a school of global affairs. So we have the opportunity to invite students from all over the globe. But I think there is something to be said about the fact that under the current, you know, global leadership slash hegemony is what I would say, the United States foreign policy impacts global relationships. So if we can't figure this out here in the United States, what is the purpose of recruiting global leaders um, to solve problems over there um, if we can't necessarily do that over here? Um, I would say my very pointed reflection and recommendation for the university at large, I think President Jenkins and the larger institution has to have a vision for racial justice. We need to have an institutional vision for racial justice. Currently, as we speak, there are plenty of opportunities for students, faculty, and staff to seek help from individual allies and accomplices, from individual department initiatives. I know the Keough School, Dean Appleby has initiated um, the Keough School's initiative for racial justice, but we have yet to see a campus-wide institutional vision for racial justice. And what happens is you leave these efforts towards racial justice, again, remembering that racial, racial injustice is a systemic issue. You leave individual departments and people feeling gaslit by the institution, feeling as if this is a problem that is endured and can only be solved internally, by individuals and or individual isolated departments, rather than being a larger systemic vision for racial justice to address um, yeah, the systemic issue that is racial injustice um, at the University of Notre Dame. So um, that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Fiana. Uh, Kaya, and then I'm going to hand off to Kaya over to Michaela. Um, yeah, I was thinking of um, addressing your question from like the perspective of an undergraduate student um, and like it, both personal and also like speaking to my peers about instances of, you know, racial discrimination and profiling by other students and also faculty and staff. 
And I think a large part of the problem is that the university doesn't take a firm stance on being committed to anti-racism at this campus. Um, I think, like, quite frankly, I'm tired of receiving apology emails and empty statements from the university about being sorry for their actions or how it casts something in a bad light or, you know, just offering a few sentences on why another Black life um, taken was, you know, a tragedy. I think that there comes a time when after receiving the same words over and over, it starts to become, it starts to feel empty. And I think that's when the quote unquote allyship becomes performative. So I think that um, if the university wants to actually make their students of color feel heard and um, appreciated, that they need to actually put action behind their words and start to give consequences to people who are the aggressors in instances of discrimination, harassment, profiling. Um, you know, at at most, I think those aggressors are getting a slap on the wrist. Um, and in many instances, it's not even addressed. I know people who have reported incidences and the aggressor behind it was never even talked to about it. So I think that um, the university has to do more in addressing these harms and holding people accountable for the actions and um, the ways that they are creating an environment in which students of color don't feel safe or taken care of or protected. I should say, you know, as, as a member of faculty, it's shameful. It's shameful to hear our students, and you're obviously not the first, to say that you don't feel safe on campus. Uh, and that really is a matter of enormous regret and shame and one that needs to be addressed urgently. So thank you for that, Michaela. Um, I have a pretty different experience, I think, being Native American and also being an undergrad. Um, like Janela said, like you walk into a classroom and you're the only one there. Um, that happens for me in every classroom I walk into. Um, Native students make up less than 1% of the student population at Notre Dame. Um, our number is so small that they don't even list it as a statistic on the admissions website. Um, we basically don't exist to the university. Um, there's no Native faculty for us. There's nowhere for us to go other than um, like general like MSPS is kind of what we have for a community um, because we're so small that you know there's four or five of us who even know each other it's really hard for native students to meet each other and then stay connected um, and as someone who comes from a native community this campus is shocking it's ridiculous for me as someone who grew up around people who are only native to walk onto campus and there's no one like me um, so from the university's perspective is one having more native students should just be an easy answer, um, especially considering um, the Pokagon Band is so close to us. Um, we're on land that the university purchased from the Pokagon Band, um, you know, a long time ago. I don't know the exact year. Um, so having more Native students shouldn't really be that big of an issue, um, considering the tribal presence around the school. Um, and but then the problem is how do you retain Native students when you, come on, when you come onto campus and realize you're not in a situation that you've ever been in where no one is like you. Um, and it is really jarring for a lot of Native students who come from Native communities. And I've known several students who have left because of that, because the transition is so difficult. And because we don't have Native faculty or staff to help support us, there's nowhere for you to turn when you feel that way um, and then when you have these issues being Native American no one on campus knows how to address them my rectors don't know what to tell me um, my I had a friend who went to the priest um, who was supposed to serve as the multicultural priest who um, and he went to him and he was like I don't know what to tell you I can't help you because you're not what I'm used to. Um, 
So the first step is getting Native staff, getting a community of Native people who Native students can turn to when it's kind of hard to find it on campus. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Makeda, for sharing that. I'm going to make a, just a few closing remarks and then give the last word to Fiana. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege and, um, and it's painful to listen to you expressing your passions, your frustrations, your anger, your hope, your courage. I want to repeat what I said in my introductory remarks that the mediation program is not a student organization. It is not an excuse for student activism. All of you are in organizations that are engaged and that is fantastic. I encourage members of the audience who are students to get involved in organizations of your choice on campus or off campus. We are only effective when we are working in a united fashion and in partnerships in organizations as individuals we lack the power and the influence to affect change. So I salute all of you involved in student activism representing your organizations. The mediation program would be very happy to continue to serve as a platform, as a forum for facilitating dialogue. And if you have concrete ideas, you the panelists or you members of the audience on activities that the mediation program can pick up in a way that's fitting for a mediation program, then be very happy to hear uh, your ideas. The recording of this event will be put onto our website. Uh, some of the questions that were put through the Q&A function asked whether the students could identify specific and concrete proposals they would make. I think many of you have already done that and your voices will be uh, available for posterity on, on the website. Um, I also would underline, as I indicated in my introductory remarks, that many organizations have added to our website new statements or existing statements on the problem of racial injustice in the US. So this becomes something of a repository of ideas and thinking and narratives about addressing racial justice. I want to thank all of you for participating and uh, thank the audience for participating. I'm going to hand over to Fiana, who will uh, lead us in closing. Thank you, Lori. Tonight, we had the cherished opportunity to hear the wisdom of a few young leaders, each of whom represent a critical perspective and lived experience during this time of reckoning. I want to recognize the distinctness of this panel, composed entirely of women and people of color. While it was not necessarily our intention, these are the women who were uplifted and brought forward by their colleagues to send their messages to the presidential candidates. This tells me that students on campus are ready to be led by the voices of our women of color. Let's take a minute to allow their wisdom and power to really sink in. As a first generation immigrant, Muslim and woman of color, I recognize how terms like unity, diversity, equity and inclusion serve simultaneously as buzzwords and descriptions of the epicenter of considerations for electing our next president here in this land we call the United States. But what does unity and inclusion really mean? To me, inclusion is active, it is humbling, and it is learning how to have an open and critical mind. It means recognizing the diversity in life experiences and acknowledging the legitimacy of each other's skewed circumstances. Inclusion is not a passive activity. It is not merely gathering tokens to surround yourself in a room. It requires engagement and the ability to have conversations reflecting our power, privilege, and social position. It requires the dismantling of internal arrogance and careless perpetuation of oppression. To make a commitment to inclusion, it means we commit to taking action for and internalizing knowledge that all human beings deserve dignity and thriving and fight to secure such conditions. This has become harder to do in light of recent events. Our continued exposure to things like police brutality, anti-immigrant rhetoric, and polarized media reminiscent of colonial dehumanizing logic. We minimize the voices of the marginalized and reduce complex issues to oversimplified binary framings of right versus wrong. 
In reality, the structural violence we face is far more complex. We affirm that some members of our community are currently being targeted by hate rhetoric and hostility and have historically been targeted in this way. So to respect one another, we must recognize how our words today, attitudes and actions shape others, including the ways in which the presidential candidates discuss these issues, the policies that they enact and whom we vote for as a society. We should all strive to model ways to address both systemic and individual human experiences so that this country and world can be a place where all people can live up to the ideals of a truly beloved community. This year's presidential election is an opportunity where the entire campus and at large community can engage in dialogue regarding the translation of inclusion initiatives on a societal level. We hope that this panel has provided you an opportunity for all to hear about current insights and pragmatic steps to be made towards equity and inclusion from the youth who are our script writers, our future. We invite you to continue the conversation with us at the Mediation Center and reflect on actions to be taken leading up to the election and ongoing. Again, we wanna thank you, our dear panelists for your incredible and cherished insights. Each of you represent the power and potential of our preferred future. We wanna give a shout out to Hannah and Lisa from the Kroc Institute and Bakaja Caldwell from the Black, Student, uh, Black Law Student Association for your tireless and priceless support for this event. And thank you all co-sponsors. Um, you can find your uh, names, social media tags if you wanna get involved um, in addition to their statements on racial justice as presented um, by colleagues across campus faculty and student groups um, on the Kroc Mediation website. Um, thank you again for attending and thank you for your time. Thank you, Fiana. Um, I had given you the last word, but I can't resist reporting to you, you, you may be able to see them yourselves, uh, two questions that have just come in or comments that have come in on the Q&A function, and I end with those. The one is, many thanks for your inspiring insights and reflections. That was great. Keep it up. And the other, you all gave me hope. Thank you for your commitment and dedication. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you to our audience and colleagues at CRUC. Wish you a good evening.